On that note, we're going to get started with the rest of the morning sessions, and I am very pleased to introduce Mark Dixon. He comes all the way from South Dakota, one of two South Dakotans here um, for the conference, fortunately. And Mark's an interesting guy because when you, when you think about the Missouri River, you kind of, you think of Mark and you think of Mike Scott and you think of this long, long-lived body of work that they've done with guys like Carter Johnson. And we're very, very glad to have a perspective of the other part of the arid west, the Dakotas. So let's please welcome from the University of South Dakota, Mark Dixon. All right, thanks everybody, and I uh, hope you're all just as relieved as I am to find out we actually do have lunch coming up. All right, so I want to talk about some work that we've been doing on the Missouri River, uh, primarily on the upper Missouri, on the unchannelized portion of the river, and uh, have a long list of co-authors here, including Carter Johnson and Mike Scott, Terry Malloy, who are all PIs on the project, as well as uh, some grad students and a postdoc that worked with us. And so the, th the title basically says what I'm going to cover today. We're looking at the effects of what you might call a large and frequent disturbance event, the 2011 flood, on uh, the upper Missouri River after six decades of flow regulation. So the basic outline of my talk is going to be that I'm going to give you guys kind of an overview about the Missouri River system and its management to start. Then I'm going to talk about uh, impacts of, of management on the system on ecosystems and biota with a special focus on floodplain forests. After that, I'm going to look at the effects of the 2011 flood, review some of the findings we have for that, and then finally talk about some implications uh, of our work uh, for some lessons we've learned uh, that might, uh, might pertain to restoration. So first of all, uh, you know, the Missouri was once a wild river uh, with big floods, with you know, high sediment loads, with uh, moving channels. Uh, this uh, magazine cover uh, picture, I guess, is from my town, from Vermilion, South Dakota, in 1881, uh, when a flood uh, destroyed three quarters of the town. And this dynamic river, uh, with uh, channel migration, you know, with meandering, with channel abandonment, various processes, definitely helped to uh, make its uh, riparian landscape. But the river today is a working river, as most of the large rivers in the temperate zone are. Based on at least some, um, some sources, the Missouri is the longest river in the U.S. at nearly 3,800 kilometers long. And its drainage basin occupies about one-sixth of the continental U.S. In addition, I mentioned it's a working river, it's got the largest reservoir storage system in the U.S. as well. And uh, my map here, I've got these these three different colors that represent sort of different management regimes or types of infrastructure on the system. So the lower one-third, about 750 miles or 1,200 kilometers, uh, is the channelized river. So this area has been uh, narrowed and um, stabilized, channelized, in order to generate a, a narrower, uh, deeper channel for navigation, for barge navigation. Now the upper two-thirds is split, I've got these red and blue colors here, and uh, this upper two-thirds sort of in part is the servant of the lower third in terms of managing flows with uh, a series of six large dams and reservoirs that were built in the 20th century, uh, especially with the five that were built between the 1950s and the early 1960s in the Dakotas. Um, so those are in the red, uh, about half of the area up there also is more sort of remnant riverine stretches of river, uh, although they are influenced, of course, by the upstream dams. And this dam and reservoir system is managed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for a number of different um, codified, authorized purposes, including uh, some of the traditional ones, such as flood control, uh, navigation, hydropower, but uh, interesting, rec interestingly, recreation and fish and wildlife are also mentioned as authorized purposes and are getting a little bit more press as being important in the system. Okay, so it's not surprising that in a system that's so engineered that there are going to be major, in, uh, major effects on fluvial processes in it, uh, really by design. And this, in fact, this is what we see if we look at downstream effects of this series of the six dams and reservoirs. At Sioux City, which is below the last uh, dam on the system, we see that floods essentially were shut off 
after the 1952 flood event, uh, which happened to coincide with, with when several of the dams in the Dakotas were being built, uh, with you know, the possible exception, I guess, of the 2011 flood. We also see that the general shape of the hydrograph uh, has been greatly altered, that uh, the former you know, kind of double humped uh, flood peak that we had in the spring and early summer has been wiped out, basically smeared across the uh, rest of the navigation season uh, into November. So great changes in, you know, we talk about flow being the master variable, uh, great changes in flow, uh, in the distribution of flow temporally in the system. And along with flow, you know, the other half of the equation really are, are sediment regimes. And uh, Dave Merritt mentioned the other day that, you know, talked about the dams on the Colorado being these great sediment traps. It's the same thing on the Missouri, uh, you know, formerly known as the great, the big muddy, uh, but uh, sediment transport has been greatly altered, greatly reduced on the Missouri River with sediments trapped behind dams. And as a result, we've had significant channel downcutting, channel incision that's occurred below some of these dams, leading to disconnection between uh, floodplain and channel. Now, at the opposite end of inter-reservoir segments, we have the opposite issue going on. We have sediment-laden water from the channel, although probably less sediment than it would have formerly had, hitting the slack waters of the reservoir, sediment dropping out, uh, aggrading the bottom of the, uh, you know, filling in the, the reservoir and also aggrading the river channel and the lower portions of these segments, leading to rising water tables, water levels that uh, increase wetland area, and also may have negative effects on other terrestrial ecosystems as you go upstream, you know, such as flooding out riparian forests. Although Malia will talk, give us, give the whole story on this in, a, in after a little bit. And I'm not going to talk much about the lower river today, but uh, needless to say that uh, channelization has greatly altered both the diversity and the total area of aquatic habitats on that part of the river, really completely changing the riverscape. So it's really common sense, I think, that with all this infrastructural uh, change, all of these changes on physical processes, there also have been great impacts on the biota and the ecosystems of the river. And uh, these are the focus of management by the Army Corps of Engineers, is the federal agency that, that runs the system. And they're primarily focused on species which either formerly or presently are threatened and endangered. So for instance, with all the changes that have occurred in riverine habitat and fragmentation by dams, these types of processes have imperiled large river fish, such as the pallid sturgeon. With changes in sediment loads and floods, uh, sandbar habitat is generally decreased on the system, leading to imperilment of sandbar nesting birds like least terns and piping plovers. And last but not least, uh, these changes have also led to problems with cottonwood recruitment, as we've seen on many other rivers in the West, with potential effects on things like the bald eagle. And so the story on Plains Cottonwood is one I think that most of you guys are pretty familiar with. I guess we've had a smattering uh, of, talk, of talk about this at the meeting so far. But Plains Cottonwood is a pioneer or ruderal species. It's a disturbance adapted species. Uh, you know, it releases large numbers of seeds that, that travel over large distances. Um, but they need these bare mineral, moist bare mineral substrates for recruitment to occur. You know, in general, cottonwoods are not going to, your plains cottonwood at least, is not going to regenerate within its own stand. It needs to have new areas created where recruitment can occur. And under natural conditions on many alluvial rivers, this occurred through fluvial dynamics, through channel migration, channel abandonment, all of these types of things, which, uh, you know, not surprisingly, often decline when you put a dam on a system. And so the cottonwood problem, basically, uh, that we observe throughout the West is basically that when you regulate flows, when you put in these structures, you tend to reduce fluvial and geomorphic dynamism, and you tend to reduce regeneration of riparian cottonwoods. So uh, there's a suite of changes that we've seen on the Missouri River that are, some of them are probably due directly to flow regulation, others may be due to other factors. Uh, but this whole syndrome of changes that we see, uh, we do see evidence for limited cottonwood recruitment during recent decades, 
with uh, most forests being pre-dam in their origin. Uh, we also see long-term declines in forest area that are partially probably due to flow regulation, but also other factors, such as just land use conversion as the area was being settled more intensively, as well as inundation from those large Dakota uh, and Montana reservoirs. And even within the stands that are, are still there, within these remnant stands, you know, we have seen this increasing disconnection between river and floodplain. And we see a number of changes in species composition and structure with increases, as we, again, as we've seen on many rivers throughout the West, increases in invasive uh, woody species. Uh, in the Dakotas, it's eastern red cedar and Russian olive, as well as increases in exotic herbs. And there's some evidence also of declines in the native later successional woody species with, uh, again, with that disconnection between floodplain and channel leading to lower recruit evidence of lower recruitment for box elder and some other species. Um, of course, Dutch elm disease is a real game changer uh, with the importance of American elm formerly in these forests. And now uh, with green ash being one of the main species that appears to be doing well, uh, there's this impending threat of emerald ash borer when it reaches um, uh, the Dakotas and farther west. And so, I mean, these are, you know, these, these, there are many reasons why cottonwood forests may be valued, but uh, one important reason why we should take some notice of these changes are that uh, cottonwood forests do provide important habitat for a variety of wildlife species within this otherwise largely, you know, historically at least, prairie landscape. So uh, these include high diversity of uh, different species of land birds, including those that utilize early successional habitats that are you know, threatened because of the cottonwood problem, as well as later successional habitats. Uh, although even in these older forests, older forests that have cottonwood as a component tend to be a bit more diverse than those where cottonwoods have basically dropped out of the picture. Okay, so I've kind of laid out what some of the problems are. A lot of these relate to um, changes in process, right? We put in dams and uh, we put in dams and reservoirs. We put in, uh, we've stabilized the channel. We've done various things. So degradation of the system is closely related to degradation or change in processes. And in fact, that's what a, a National Research Council panel determined. Uh, when they were called in to look at and give recommendations on the Missouri River back in 2002. And so, I mean, you can read the slide, but basically they said that uh, in order to counteract this degradation, what we need to do is try to uh, recreate or restore some semblance of these, uh, of the natural hydrograph and um, geomorphic processes that help to, you know, maintain these systems in the past. So, you know, one thing that ecologists, I think, were looking for is, well, gee, what would happen if we could actually, uh, you know, get some kind of a flood on the upper Missouri? Would that, you know, would that tend to help restore some of these processes and the patterns that would emerge from them? Well, you know, the saying is, you know, be careful what you wish for. Uh, we did get a large flow event in 2011 after um, basically six decades of much lower flows. Uh, we had record runoff in the upper Missouri. Uh, during that uh, uh, spring and summer, with the highest flows since the 1952 uh, record uh, discharge on the system, and higher, um, higher peak flows than the previous post dam releases, which occurred in 19, record post dam releases, which occurred in 1997. So we had a big event. Uh, it was rather unusual in its duration. Some areas were inundated for about three months. Um, and it did, it was effective, as you can see in the picture there, in creating large expanses of sandbar uh, habitat as well. So in our work, one of the sort of overarching questions, I guess, or, that uh, sort of surrounds our different research questions is, uh, you know, what, what, what were the effects of the 2011 flood? And to what degree did this unplanned event uh, bring about some passive restoration of structure and function on the system? Or to what degree, given that it's a it's large and frequent disturbance, long duration after decades of flow regulation, could it actually have some negative impacts? Could it push the system farther away from what we might want? So we're looking at several aspects of this. Uh, first of all, forest structure and composition, uh, changes in the landscape, including forest area, 
We're looking at post-flood cottonwood recruitment to see what, to what degree the flood uh, has created opportunities for regeneration. And although I won't talk about it today, we're also looking at riparian birds from uh, before and after the flood to look at what types of effects this large event had on bird populations. Our methods are pretty simple. Um, we were rather fortuitous for us, I guess, in terms of the science. We had a uh, pre-flood study across multiple segments of the river. Oh boy. Uh, and uh, we, we resampled many of these sites uh, then after the flood as well. Same type of thing with uh, looking at land cover with aerial imagery. And then we began a program to look at uh, tracking cottonwood recruitment patches. Our study area is pretty, uh, uh, we, we have a large scale study with study segments from Montana to Kansas City. Uh, today I'm gonna focus primarily on the, the study segments that are close to my home base in uh, Vermilion, South Dakota, so segments eight and 10. All right, so first I wanted to look at forest structure and composition. I'll just kind of cut to the chase on this. So basically, our results really aren't that complicated. We do see really strong uh, effects or really strong changes from pre to post flood in woody stem density with the effects particularly great in the youngest stands. So uh, our, age our stand age class, uh, the sapling age class would have been areas that established following the, form the previous high water event in 1997. We see big declines in stem density and shrub cover in that age class. Uh, in some cases, you know, basically a complete loss of woody live woody stems with somewhat lower effects as you go to older age classes. In terms of species specific effects, um, it's probably a little bit more complex than I'm showing here, but uh, there's at least some sign that uh, effects of the flood were, were stronger on these uh, invasive woody species such as Russian olive and eastern red cedar than they were on cottonwood. For instance, if we look at the proportion of standing trees that appear to have been recently killed, we generally see higher um, proportions of Russian olive that appear to be top killed uh, than eastern red cedar, than uh, cottonwood. So some sign that we might have a positive change in that respect in terms of restoring composition more to what it would have been like historically. I'm going to just show you uh, pictorially some of the changes in land cover that occurred. Here's the 2006 NAEP for a portion of segment eight. I'm going to fade into the 2012 NAEP and let you get an impression of the change. So big increases in sandbar area, obviously. Uh, the, uh, the colors are, they're not natural. Uh, so the yellows and oranges represent forested stands that were removed, that disappeared from 2006 to 2012. Uh, and you can see that many of these coincide with the areas of, of sandbars in the main channel. Accordingly, we do see this overall increase in sandbar area if we look at the whole reach. Declines in forest area with the declines especially great for the youngest age classes, especially on the, the, my, the other study segment, segment 10, where about 90% of the sapling age class was removed by the flood. With the bulk of these going, uh, having the, basically the flood signature being converted to sand, water, or low riparian herbaceous vegetation. And in fact, if we, um, if we sort of looking at these results, one conclusion that we came up with was really that um, the flood was, did do a lot of geomorphic work, did lead to a lot of change, but those changes were mostly limited to the active channel. Uh, what we see is different than what we might have seen uh, in the historic past where the river moved considerably uh, over time and created new patches through channel meandering, or point, bar point bar formation and things. Uh, we don't really see that. We see that uh, vegetation that established since the high previous high water event got routed out again. And so we just sort of see this turnover process going on without really creation of, of new patches um, through channel migration. But there's no denying that the flood did lead to large uh, areas of sandbar habitat that were created, theoretically leading to opportunities for cottonwood regeneration. And in fact, we do see this. We see widespread recruitment in 2012. Um, 
But interestingly, we see very little recruitment from the flood year itself, from 2011. The regeneration that we see is generally low on lower sandbar surfaces. And we see at least over the first year following that um, following recruitment of that cohort, we see fairly high mortality. So there's some question as to how effective the flood was in generating new cottonwood uh, cohorts that are going to succeed over the long run. And the reasons for this are pretty straightforward, really. On most of our segments, and this is segment four, um, flows stayed high throughout the bulk of the growing season and essentially throughout the entire um, seed dispersal window for cottonwood. So really there wasn't, you didn't have the descending limb that was exposing surfaces where cottonwood could establish during that year. Instead, you had low flows the following year, you had all this sandbar area, and so you had cottonwood regenerating on these lower sandbar surfaces. There's some exception to this though, and we're investigating this, we haven't gotten very far with it, but one of the segments, segment two, up in Fort Peck Reach in Montana, actually did have more of this classic peak flow and then recession limb pattern, kind of the stepped pattern. And so perhaps, you know, some of you guys are probably familiar with the recruitment box concept of Stuart Root. You know, perhaps this does fit the recruitment box where you have declining flows, surfaces being exposed um, during the time when cottonwood seeds are flying. And so potential for regeneration on uh, a variety of elevations. And in fact, we do see some evidence of this in that we see a greater range of elevations of our seedling patches on segment two than we do on the other segments. And I might be reaching a little bit on this second point. I wanted, I wanted to see higher survival on segment two compared to some of the others. And we do see that, but uh, it's quite variable. And there are other segments of the river also that had uh, survival that was similar to what we see on segment two. So anyway, this is a work in progress. So I just wanted to sum up some of these basic findings. So well, one of the most striking effects of the flood was really this big loss of early successional uh, cottonwood habitat. Uh, with impacts, and I didn't talk about the birds, but we did with impacts on some species that you know, really key in on these early successional habitats like Bell's Vireo. So maybe something to watch. We did see this you know, at least moderately high mortality of some of these um, kind of latecomers to the riparian zone, these invasive species such as eastern red cedar and Russian olive. And the large increases in sandbar area that are kind of proving to be a boon for the sandbar nesting birds, uh, are providing habitat for cottonwood regeneration. But again, we're mostly seeing the active channel getting reworked by the flood. We're not seeing the historic sort of channel migration we used to see in the past, uh, generating new habitat, we're seeing just turnover of what was there before, primarily. We, we did see widespread recruitment, but as I said, there's sort of limits to this, uh, and there are questions as to how, well, you know, how long into the future these cohorts will persist, uh, whether they can really um, uh, replace what was lost as well because of where the recruitment occurred. And so I just wanted to sum up some of these things we've learned in terms of lessons for restoration. I guess with kind of a bias towards process-based restoration. Um, and so one is, and maybe this is common sense too, but I think, you know, we're thinking previously, well, gee, you know, if we could get some kind of a uh, flood pulse or some kind of a flow event that sort of, you know, is like a flood, perhaps we'd see some major changes. And we saw some major changes, but they weren't always in the, the direction we might have expected. Uh, as I already mentioned that the flood, because of, um, to some extent, bank stabilization, because of channel incision, uh, really was mostly doing its work in the active channel of the river and reworking vegetation that was already established previously. The long flow durations during the growing season meant that it wasn't as good of a flood as it could have been for cottonwood recruitment. So not just any flood will do. This is uh, some conclusions that uh, Carter and Carter Johnson came up with based on some of our findings. And it's that process-based restoration then might require two major steps. And one of them is that you can't just suddenly try to restore flow and sediment processes if the system is out of whack in terms of the legacies of the geomorphic change, you know, incised channels uh, and things like this. So 
one key might be, are there ways that we can uh, sort of reconnect the floodplain? Are there ways that we can counteract this long-term process of incision, these structural problems first, uh, so that uh, restoring flows and sediment transport can be more effective, in bringing about uh, positive changes. And this is another one I didn't really talk much about today, but it's actually a major one, is that with the Missouri, we're talking about this, you know, one of the great rivers, and we're talking about this multifunctional type system where you have all these different stakeholders pulling different directions. You have these eight authorized purposes, not all of which play well together, right? Uh, upper base and lower basin conflicts. So you have all these different demands on the system that make it difficult to do uh, process-based restoration in particular. And even within the, the sort of the ecological management community, you have differing goals. You have Endangered Species Act saying you need to maintain habitat for sandbar nesting birds, and for pallid sturgeon, for instance. Uh, sometimes cottonwood regeneration on those same sandbars isn't really compatible with some of those other purposes. So this is another issue. And within all that, I think one thing that we could use more on the system is more of an ecosystem approach and really, frankly, just a better appreciation for the values of, of cottonwood forests. My last point is something I haven't talked about at all, but it's just a little uh, commercial, I guess, from Malia's talk coming up in a little bit. We might need to be more creative about the types of restoration opportunities we think of. Uh, in particular, we might want to look at novel habitats that occur within the river reservoir system as potential candidates for restoration as well, such as reservoir deltas. I'd like to conclude with that. Um, funding sources from the Corps of Engineers and others, uh, the help from various people over the years and uh, landowners who gave us access, well, as well as other collaborators. A couple, I guess a gratuitous picture here of a couple of the uh, collaborators, Mike Scott and Carter Johnson. And I'll con conclude for real with, uh, if you guys want more information on our work, feel free to email me or, or Mike or Carter and uh, or check out some of the papers that uh, we've been able to, to work on over the last couple of years. Thank you. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so the question had to do with um, whether we had data that would allow us to look at, especially in the pre-dam pre years, could we analyze how much channel migration, how much channel change occurred on a year-by-year -year basis? Um, we could probably do better. We could probably do more than we did there. That was sort of just a cart, you know, just to show the, the magnitude of changes that you can observe. Um, but we're a little limited early on by just, you know, we only had uh, maps that were every so many years that were, con that were made. Um, so it's limited, I think, in doing an annual basis, but there are shorter time periods that we could look at and do more of a straight up comparison, at least. Yeah, in the back. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, it's not the most um, intensively populated part of the world, obviously, you know, much of the upper Missouri, at least. Um, I haven't really seen a lot of tendency for the Corps of Engineers to be willing to, to do that, although I think, I don't know, my... Mike Scott might have observed, I think up in the upper, the very upper reaches of Missouri, they've done a little bit more. Um, yeah. No? <laughs> so it seems like it, it ought to be feasible, but you know, they're all, as I said, there are all these different management uh, conflicts and stakeholders, and the system is managed as a whole. So what you do in one segment, you gotta figure out how you're gonna capture it in the dam, in the reservoir below. So um, I haven't seen a whole lot of movement in that direction, but you know, I'm hopeful. I think. I think that it could be possible under the right situation. I, the question had to do with whether, um, well, maybe it's understood by the answer, whether there was potential for some prescribed uh, 
uh, flows to experiment with more natural hydrographs.